I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So a question came into the chat from Shahrazad uh, at 6 p.m. my time, top of the hour. Uh, the question was, how do we disentangle without rumination? Huge question, very common. A uh, long answer would be found in my workshop on rumination, uh, letting go of rumination. Uh, you can find out more about it at my website. Uh, and it's an online workshop at this point. Uh, it's for sale. And if you'd like a scholarship, just apply for one. Uh, so that's the long answer. The short answer um, about rumination, I find two things in particular are really helpful. One is to try to feel what's underneath the ruminating. Because very often ruminating serves the function of keeping what we really feel, particularly the depths of it, at bay. So if you go more directly to the primary matter, you really feel it. That acts like a short a circuit breaker for ruminating. And also, um, make a plan, take action, and recognize that you've done that. That also can help with rumination. Additionally, additionally, which relates to my topic tonight, adopting an attitude, an orientation of don't know, not so sure, maybe so, maybe not, don't know. Reserve the right to not know. Applying that to rumination immediately tends to put, it's not quite a pin in the balloon, it's not so much that it pops, but that it just goes, grounds right out. So we're gonna be exploring tonight one really of the major themes um, in a lot of uh, strands of Buddhism, the benefits of not being so sure, not knowing. And I'm gonna be exploring with you this topic in a lot of practical ways. But before I do that, I see that Elev, you have your hand up and I wanna say that uh, I'll take a quick question here then I'm gonna go into the main flow of my topic. So I'm gonna ask you to unmute. And if you do have a question for me at this gathering, please make sure it's succinct, short, clear, and of general interest. Okay, no pressure. All right, Alev, did you want to ask me something? I see that your hand's raised. And maybe you accidentally raised your hand. Okay, so I'm gonna lower that hand. And if you do have a question later, just pop your hand back up. Okay, here we go. And I want you to know a lot about not knowing. So, uh, you can see the quotation that I put into the chat, a uh, classic from the Dhammapada. Um, I'll say it here. Let's see. Uh, mind precedes all phenomena. Mind matters most. Everything is mind made. Uh, to be really clear, the Buddha acknowledged the existence of purely physical objects. This bell ringer, my head. But after that, in terms of the inner world, he points out there's an ongoing process of construction. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about magical incantations, manifesting pearl necklaces, uh, or curing cancer somehow. Uh, he's focusing here on the constructing of our ongoing experiencing of living. All right. He continues, if with an impure mind one performs any action of speech or body, then suffering will follow that person as the cartwheel follows the foot of the draught animal or the oxen. Mind precedes all phenomena. Mind matters most. Everything is mind made. On the other hand, if with a pure mind one performs any action of speech or body or thought, then happiness will follow that person as like a shadow that never departs. It's one of the best known teachings from Buddhism. So what is this mind or what can we, what kind of mind can we have as we um, 
experience things in this life. Well, one opportunity for us is to, from time to time, certainly, bring a certain perspective, a frame of, don't know, not so sure. Could be so, not always so. Maybe so, maybe not, don't know. And that attitude, which um, tends to be not rewarded in most jobs or school situations, I don't know, uh, you know, is actually really, really helpful. Why might that be? So we're going to be exploring that here. And to be clear, sometimes we really do need to know. You know, I, I need to know that I should not whack my head too hard. That's useful. Uh, when I was preparing this talk, suddenly, uh, you know, the, the lyric from the Paul Simon song, uh, the lyric being, I'd rather be a hammer than a nail. And my wife and I have been watching lately the documentary about Paul Simon. I think it's called In Restless Dreams, close to that. And it's really quite touching. There's also a very interesting uh, interview, uh, conversation really, with him and Stephen Colbert. You can find it on YouTube. It's fairly recent. Um, and toward the end of this 20, 30 minute conversation, uh, Stephen Colbert asks Paul Simon about his spiritual beliefs. And they both really get into a discussion about the ultimate potential, ground of all, the divine perhaps, and their experiences of that. And then Paul Simon says very sincerely, for his, his attitude is that either way, it's amazing that the universe is here at all. And if he suddenly discovered that there was no underlying transcendental ground of all, he would still know good from bad. He would still know right from wrong, right? So we need to know good and bad. We need to know right from wrong. And it's okay to do that. Uh, we need to know that, um, you know, we've turned off the lights, <laughs> we've locked the door. Uh, we need to know that deep down inside, we have a good heart. We need to know that some people do love us, if that's true. We need to know these things. I think we need to know, and it's good to know, that a human individual uh, that is now called the Buddha lived 2,500 years ago and taught and offered many very wise things. That's useful to know. It's also important that if you're at all prone to feeling somehow disconnected from ordinary reality, be careful with this practice. Be careful with this practice. I think about the metaphor of the kite. If the kite is to soar, someone needs to be holding the string. <laughs> it needs to be grounded in some way. And that combination of grounding and wind helps lift the kite to the sky. So in that way, if you have a tendency to become unmoored in problematic ways, you know, be careful and keep reminding yourself of the things that you actually really do know that are true. Last, as we get into this, this attitude of don't know is not about pernicious doubt. And, and I'll say more about that a little later when I talk about applying the attitude of not knowing to what the Buddha called the five major hindrances to practice or the five major coverings of our true nature, the good news already. Um, this is not about just endless skepticism. It's more of a don't know. A lot of doubt takes the form of knowing that it's probably not true. That's a kind of knowing. Don't know mind. You can feel it right now. See what happens when you just say to yourself, don't know, not so sure, maybe. There's an openness to it. As Suzuki Roshi put it, um, in the beginner's mind, the don't know mind, are many, many possibilities. In the knowing mind, in the expert's mind, are only a few. So we're gonna be exploring to some extent the balance of knowing, useful knowing, in the Eightfold Path in Buddhism, wise view is usually where the eight um, start. That's a kind of knowing, all right? So there's a place for knowing. But for many of us, 
wow, me included, as someone who's been rewarded most of my life for having the right answer and knowing, um, <laughs> with penalties for having the wrong answer and not knowing, well, wow, it's like a lubricant. It's like a solvent releasing, you know, that which tangles us up, shackles. It dissolves the shackles of the mind to open into, oh, don't know. It's like you're looking around. It's like those pictures of, the, I think, a medieval painting where you, Renaissance painting where you, you know, the person is popping their head through the familiar frame and <gasps> seeing reality with wonder, right? Awe and wonder uh, require a certain, <gasps> don't know. So let's explore this, all right? So first of all, in everyday life, Boy, is it so much trouble begins, doesn't it? When we get righteous about other people, we get attached to our case, we know what they really meant, right? We know that they're this way. We globalize and essentialize about the complexity of a, another person with hundreds of different factors and forces and aspects and characteristics all buzzing away. Bleep. We know they're a certain way, and we wrap in, in that knowing, we wrap that complexity in a single package. And, you know, that then leads to so much trouble. Think about how it feels often, uh, if you can do it, to just not be so sure about another person, to listen with curiosity, or, or to kind of not be so sure about your own positions about them. You know, when I, I was, uh, you know, to paraphrase something I, I shared with someone recently, uh, much of what that has been good that I've done in my life has come from being right about certain things, being correct about them. You know, certainly much good has come from being right. I would have to say that probably just about all of what's been bad or, you know, from me toward other people originated in or was fueled in part by being right or thinking I was right, knowing that I was right. You know? Think about how it feels to be with other people who are convinced about certain things. You know, I, I was parking earlier today with my wife and uh, there was a driver in the car in front of me and it looked like it was, there were two parking spaces. Uh, there was uh, in front of me and there was a third one I wanted. This person looked like they parked right in the middle of two spaces. Uh, I said to them, uh, you're taking two spaces. It turned out that they were halfway into a driveway they needed to back up into the proper space, whatever. I was polite, I backed up. And wow, that person was convinced that I was mad at them, I was critical. Uh, you know, you throw gender socialization into the mix. I was a man, they were a woman. You know, men tend to be kind of jerky uh, often um, toward women as drivers, blah, blah. And that person just knew somehow what I was, you know, thinking and intending. And in fact, no, I was just like, oh, you know, are, are you moving forward? I, I need to park behind you. I'm just waiting till they settled in. Yeah. So what's it like, you know, to be on the receiving end, whether it's a little trivial example like that or big ones, like when you're a kid and people have categorized you in certain ways, all right? They've put you into certain groups, like the kids who, you know, can't read and, uh, or, you know, think about bias, prejudice, being being targeted, structural uh, discrimination. That's a kind of knowing about you that is just terrible, right? It doesn't feel good to be categorized, slotted, boxed in those ways. So that's a way into recognizing the blessing for other people of approaching them with more of a don't know. 
I find with my wife, if she says something and I just give myself what Tara Brock calls the sacred pause, I just remind myself when I'm on my game, which is not always, uh, whew, don't know. And instead of leading with some kind of attitude or exasperation, if I don't quite get it, you know, uh, not jumping to conclusions about her, I just start out by, I'm not sure, sorry, could you say that again? Or I don't quite understand, or, huh, I don't know. <laughs> Things go a lot better, all right? There's this lovely quotation from the poet William Butler Yeats that I want to share with you in the chat. There's kind of a deep contribution we can make to others if we can rest in a mind of not knowing. He writes, we can make our minds so like still water, so like still water that beings gather about us that they may see, it may be, their own images and so live for a moment with a clearer perhaps even with a fiercer life because of our quiet. It's quite deep. Also, not knowing helps you not jump to conclusions about yourself. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. think of all the things we're sure about about ourselves or we rapidly conclude. You know, the structure of language is this procession of knowings, sequentially. There is a place for it. Knowing, as Paul Simon sings, uh, the difference between a hammer and a nail. Okay, but still we can become trapped uh, in that procession of language with its implication, its implicit knowingness. And we apply that a lot to ourselves. You know, try it out over the next week. If there's one headline from this talk, it's to bring more of a sense of not knowing to yourself, to your history, to how you label yourself, how you judge yourself. In most cases, tilted negatively because of the brain's negativity bias. See what happens when you regard yourself like, don't know, huh, I wonder. <laughs> Not knowing also really supports curiosity, because if we already know, why bother investigating? Uh, not knowing about, you know, your own interior, what's down there? What's really the source of your, of your sadness? What's really underneath it all? Curiosity incorporates not knowing. And that curiosity, that not knowing, really helps to drive and support the investigation factor of awakening. The Buddha listed seven factors of awakening. They're all ordinary, psychological. Uh, some of them are fairly refined, but there's nothing mystical about them. They're all down to earth, factors of awakening, forces, causes, engines, fuels of awakening, um, mindfulness, investigation, energy, effort, determination over time. That's number three. Um, tranquility, bliss, Extraordinary states of, con of consciousness, concentration, and equanimity. Wow, right? And investigation in many ways is right at the foundation of the rest of them. So curiosity really supports that. I like this quotation from E.B. White, who of course wrote Charlotte's Web. I like this. It is best to have strong curiosity 
and weak affiliations. In other words, by, um, binds, boundedness, being stuck, right? Okay, so everyday life. Now, let's take it a little more deeply in terms of classic early Buddhist psychology. So the Buddha said that if we look at the mind altogether, we can sort everything about it into essentially five piles called the aggregates. It's a funny term. And um, here we are rolling along and things happen, okay? That's the moment of contact with some stimulus. So let's say the ear and ear consciousness contacts a sound. Then the sequence occurs. It begins with what's called form, which is whatever's physical as well as the barest sense of something happening. And then in the sequence, there's the hedonic tone, pleasant and pleasant and neutral of that. Third, there's perception, uh, labeling, categorizing, knowing what it is. And then there's the, all the other contents of mind last in a space of awareness. Those are the five aggregates. This is actually really useful because there's a sequence when something happens, your partner says something, or somebody literally starts kind of yelling at you while they're trying while you're trying to park your car. Uh, you read something. Your the thought comes up, oh, I have a task. That's the stimulus. There's contact. And then even though in the in the typical list, the hedonic tone, pleasant and um, pleasant neutral, sometimes called feeling tone, often comes next, right after form and before perception. Actually, in your brain, much of the time, perception comes first. Something happens. Uh, there's there's a conscious process of labeling, of knowing, percep that's perception. And then on the basis of that knowing, categorizing what it is, friend or foe, near or far, um, helpful, harmful, that categorizing. Then on the basis of that, the hedonic tone follows. And then on the basis of that, the sense of myself, craving, suffering, the whole mess. Well, let's have a little quotation as well from the Dhammapada here. So there's this ongoing process of the mind seizing, it grabs, okay? Not knowing is like a buffer at the front end of the processing stream that disrupts that grabbing. Because when we don't know, it could be anything. You know, I had a spiritual teacher uh, for uh, in depth for three years uh, in the 1980s, uh, Da Frijan sometimes called Adi Da or Lavananda. And uh, I really got a lot from that uh, teaching stream. And one of the things he talked about was he called it divine ignorance. It's the healthy attitude of recognizing that fundamentally we don't know what anything actually is. We might throw out language like, well, it's protons and electrons and neutrons. But do you know what an electron really is? <laughs> you know, well, it's quarks. Do you know what a quark? Does anyone know what a quark really is? I mean, right? So, and there's something very powerful about resting in that attitude of not knowing, right? Um, it keeps you in the present. You don't know. Try it. It's really profound. If you start getting upset about something, ask yourself, you know, and your mind is, is, loud, it's ruminating with its conclusions. What happens if you just stay in the present and let yourself not know? Now, sometimes you have to act quickly. You need to know quickly. Okay. But if you can, explore the power of not knowing. It really brings you into the present. There's a sense of this that I find really beautiful 
here from Mathieu Ricard. He writes, One should learn to let thoughts arise and be freed to go as soon as they arise, instead of letting them invade one's mind. In the freshness of the present moment, the past is gone, the future is not born, and um, if one remains in pure mindfulness and freedom, potentially disturbing thoughts arise and go without leaving a trace. Matu is talking about this stance of not knowing. We're, we're with what's there. We're not resisting it. We're not dissociating away from it. We're just um, allowing ourselves. We're taking the pressure off. That's another one of the benefits here. You don't have to be so sure so fast when that's available. Um, and in the present, before uh, what are called the formations, that fourth category of the aggregates gets going in which the sense of self is and craving is occurring. Um, if you're always just before that starts to happen, in other words, if you're very much with form itself, if you're with just pure contact, what's occurring, what's arising, and you're disrupting the perception aggregate, which then um, breaks the chain that leads from stimulus form to perception to I like it, I don't like it, pleasant, unpleasant, to a whole bunch of mishigas all in the field of awareness. Those are the five aggregates. If you're here, if you're really in the front, if you're at the kind of front edge of now, as I put it, notice it. It's quiet there. It's really good. It's peaceful. You just don't know yet. I don't know yet. Maybe yet is a useful word for you. Don't know yet. You can reflect later, you can form your conclusions later. There's a place for that, discernment, discrimination. But meanwhile, especially if you have the habit, as I've been trained in, of knowing, um, categorizing, uh, you know, identifying, planning, acting, reevaluating, knowing, 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 knowing. If you have that tendency, and if, as I do, uh, you have any tendency toward um, righteousness or <laughs> superior certainty. <laughs> this is a great practice. <laughs> Takes the pressure off. Don't know yet. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> let's see this. Yeah. And then to finish here, I want to talk about applying this attitude of not knowing to each one of the hindrances. The hindrances are five things that the Buddha identified that hinder us, they slow us down, they impede our progress. And the root of the word for that's translated as hindrance um, from the language of Pali, a key language of early Buddhism, that uh, root of the word is covering. So we're, we're, it's not just that our progress is impeded or blocked, it's that our underlying radiance is covered over. So what are the five? Uh, in no particular order, I'll start with doubt. And when we're stuck in doubt, a lot of people are stuck in self-doubt, right? They do nine good things in a row and they still doubt their own worth and they're looking for the 10th that they mess up. Self-doubt. It's a kind of toxic skepticism, even a pushing away of legitimate reassurance, legitimate recognition of your own okayness in the present and your own goodness, your own accomplishing. Um, it's kind of like people who are always sort of holding at arm's length the good news, that they're just afraid to let it sink in and to believe it, to um, develop conviction. One of the uh, spiritual powers in Buddhism, 
They're called powers, not mystical powers, but they're, but they're powerful, is uh, translated often as conviction or faith, informed faith, belief, right? You, you don't have to think about it all the time because you know it's true, including a sense of your own worth. Doubt, pernicious doubt undermines all that. And in some ways it's said that doubt is the worst of uh, the hindrances because anything can be doubted. It just undermines you. So not knowing is like a circuit breaker that just takes the fuel away, just tr takes the electricity away from doubt. You don't know. Like, and it's really powerful. To, you know, if that voice arises in your mind that's critical or or toxic or shaming or punishing or always disbelieving, well, if they only knew the real you or, you know, well, yeah, I'll wait to the next time or, you know, that voice starts going. Uh, sometimes we get trapped in arguing with it and then it becomes like we're stuck to it, right? It's much more effective sometimes to just look at it and go, don't know. <laughs> you could add, you know, the Buddha's statement supposedly when he saw, you know, delusion and the trickster Mara coming at him the, the night he was enlightened. Uh, he said, I recognize you. I see you. You might say to yourself, I see you, toxic doubt. I see you, inner critic. I see you, Simon Legree, you nasty fellow you. I know who you are, right? And then you might just say, don't know. You might be right. I don't know. It's extremely powerful. You're not arguing with it. You might be right. I don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Boom. Instantly, a wave of relief. It's like cool air blowing away the, the fog. Right? Okay. The next hindrance is ill will. In other words, um, rancor, uh, punishing desires, uh, bitterness towards someone, you know, you're going to get them. You schadenfreude, you delight in their suffering, ill will. And it's interesting that the Buddha really emphasized the importance of disengaging from ill will. Um, you know, maintaining a case against someone in your mind, that's ill will. Not knowing, don't know, you ask yourself, am I so sure about their intentions? What else was going on inside them? Am I so sure about the complexity of their history, all the things that led them to be that way, to do that with me? Don't know. Don't know. You know, even when someone has clearly wronged you, it's not that you're doubting that they wronged you, because that would not be wise if they did wrong you. It's more, huh? don't know about all the things that led them to do that toward me. Don't know. Even looking back at the analysis you've had, if it's a long-term relationship uh, about how bad they are and the history and the twists and the turns, it, you can apply don't know mind retroactively in important relationships that have conflict and trouble in them. Just kind of reviewing the history and decisions you made at certain junctures or judgments you made at certain junctures, you could reevaluate them and go, wow, I'm not so sure that was right. Or I'm not so sure that that was what was true. Or I'm definitely not sure that that was the whole story. Okay. And then third hindrance. Translated in different ways, um, I'm going to call it regret, remorse, agitation, restlessness, worry. We're discombobulated. <laughs> Let's call it that. Especially regret and remorse. And boy, don't know mind applied to things you regret or often which are re related to something you've perceived. Remember perception aggregate. You've categorized, labeled as a mistake or you did something bad, or you were bad, and then regret, and remorse, even shame follow. Whew, don't know mind is a really useful solvent. It kind of dissolves, it eases, 
you know, and just clears. Um, a lot of toxic regret and remorse, guilt, shame, brooding, ruminating, rehashing, you know, revisiting conversations, revisiting events. Just see what happens when you bring kind of the, the, the cool breeze of not sure, don't know, not always so, you know, to all that. And you might experience, as I have, this, oh, a kind of a benediction sinking in, a kind of blessing. It feels good. It's easing. It's relieving. Um, maybe underneath the remorse and regret is just simply sadness. Simple sadness. And that's what's really there to, to feel. It's not so much that you, you know, maybe you've, you know, you've kind of worked your way through regret and remorse and you're just down to, oh, I feel sad that our relationship has come to this. And that's simple, simple. And not knowing can help you get to that simplicity, which is a lot more bearable and and much less occupying and preoccupying. It's simply sadness. And no one gets through this life without some sadness and how things turned out. Fourth uh, hindrance, often translated, I love the terms, sloth and torpor. Uh, You know, just sort of being lazy about things or procrastinating. And I think not knowing is really great for procrastination. You know, we keep putting things off or why do we do that? Often it's because we're afraid that if we start acting, it'll become, you know, uncomfortable. Something bad will happen. Maybe it'll be exhausting to make an effort. And not knowing applied to the things we keep putting off is really helpful because it's sort of like, I don't know, you know. And so then you think to yourself, well, since I don't know, why not give it a try? Right? Uh, There's this, uh, you know, just I love this little haiku here. I'm moving toward a finish from Issa. You know, on a branch floating down river, a cricket singing. (laughs) We don't know what's around the bend, do we? The cricket doesn't know. And as Suzuki Roshi put it, living is like setting sail in a boat that you know will eventually sink. Uh, sure. I mean, that cricket at some level, you know, the, the branch will eventually sink probably. The cricket's kind of there. And still the cricket can sing. We, with that attitude of not knowing, we can, uh, we can still sing in our own ways. So finishing up here, um, I want to say one last thing that is... Um, Is, is out there as a possibility. When your mind is in don't know, you start to get closer and closer to existence as it is before labeling and judging. And as you get closer and closer to that, you can start to have an intuition of what's always just before the present conditioned moment, which the Buddha talks about here as the unconditioned. He says, the entire world is in flames. He's really referring both to material phenomena and our own mind, metaphorically. The entire world is going up in smoke. The entire world is burning. The entire world is vibrating. But that which does not vibrate or burn, which is experienced by the noble ones, noble in terms of being in a process of awakening, where death has no entry, which means things don't pass away, in that my mind delights. And I just wanted to finish with a naming of some ultimate possibilities that can become more available to us as we rest in not knowing. 
as my two Ricard says, just receiving the the moment as it arises. Uh, it's a really beautiful place. And as uh, Martha writes here, and I'm now remembering, the fifth hindrance is attachment to sensory pleasure. And there too, not knowing is really helpful because we have an inner ad agency kind of rooted in pretty ancient subcortical, motivational, emotional, reward-seeking systems of the brain that tend to overpromise the benefits of um, you know, sense pleasures. And if we're rested more and don't know, don't know if that dessert will taste so good. Don't know if, you know, going to that sports bar will be such a good idea tonight. Don't know. Huh. And it gives you a space, buys you some time in which you can, you know, exercise good judgment. Okay. So, what do you make of all this? A lot of wonderful questions came in or comments um, about various things, but, but in the remaining time here, I'm gonna stick with things that relate to not knowing. Okay, so Char asks me to here, hello Rick, I'm always curious how to apply these principles to close relationships like family and relationships that people are in the ego. So if I follow you right, Gosh, I think uh, the more challenging <laughs> the situation and close relationships often are pretty challenging, the more we need to resource up. And one of the most powerful resources, which is accessible to us, unless we're completely triggered in the moment, is to uh, bring in a, a little perspective of not so sure, don't know, curiosity, investigation, slowing it down. So I find that particularly helpful with people with whom we're very familiar. The more familiar we are with something, the more useful it is to bring an attitude of not knowing. If it's completely novel to us, well, then we start with not knowing. Like, what? Huh? Huh? You know? Uh, so it's those like <laughs> your partner, in my case, or a familiar object, like looking at a familiar object, you know, a glass, let's say, go, huh? Do I actually know what that is? <laughs> Don't know. So to me, Shar, uh, this is particularly helpful, uh, you know, applied to family members. Um, let's see, creative process. Auntie, profoundly creative person. Hello there. Uh, as an artist, yes, so much of creativity in the creative process involves knowing, not knowing, knowing, not knowing, knowing, not knowing, right? Yes, Laura makes this wonderful point at 27 minutes past that um, she writes, this is also illuminating and now I better understand why my students so enjoy moments in which I admit, I don't know something. It's a leveler, right? I, th I think, you know, with, with people, if we're clear about it, um, not to uh, uh, muzzle ourselves or to be a doormat, but if it's skillful to not lead with knowing, especially if you have the socially constructed position, as I do, uh, of the one who knows. So it especially helps people feel more comfortable if you disclose, oh, don't, don't know, what do you think? I remember doing an interview with Dacher Keltner, who's a world-class professor, uh, teaches at UC Berkeley, great researcher, founder of the Greater Good Science Center there, kind of my academic home base. Anyway, I was interviewing Dacher about um, the evolution of compassion, a subject that he's a, certainly a major expert on. And what was so striking was how often Dacher would slow down and ask me, well, Rick, what do you think about that? And he was really sincere. It made the conversation much more lively and it also helped me feel a lot more comfortable in it. And I just appreciated how gracious he was. And I, I left with a, an even deeper liking and respect for him. Okay, let's see if there's some other things. Someone, Kathleen writes, it seems so overwhelming to address all the hindrances with not knowing. Well, I, I'd be really curious, like what makes it overwhelming? 
And maybe just too many to think about. Maybe that's overwhelming. That's, I get it, right? So you just pick one. And if one of those hindrances is particularly, um, you know, relevant for you, uh, then see what happens when you bring a sense of don't know to it. See it as an experiment even. See how, you know, it might be helpful for you here. Okay, great. Right. <laughs> so, Christy, I'm going to finish with you. Um, so, hi, Rick. Thank you so much for your giving heart and mind. I appreciate it, um, really. Uh, I am currently choosing between two brain surgeons, and I truly don't know. Any ideas on this? Knowing something would really help. Thank you. So, this is an example where um, certainly we have to make a choice. And... Uh, for me, it's helpful to appreciate that, and I can speak as someone who worked for a year doing probabilistic risk analyses for a PhD mathematician uh, about things like what are the odds of a plane crashing if we put an airport, if we build an airport near a city. And what you start to realize is that proper decision making is always based on your state of knowledge. And so if your state of knowledge is that there's a 60% likelihood that surgeon A is better than surgeon B, then you should pick surgeon A. Even if 40% of the time it turns out that you know surgeon B would have been better, you still made the right choice. And that means we have to live with some uncertainty. We have to live with not knowing perfectly. We don't have perfect knowledge. And that's what we have to live with. So that takes courage and also wisdom. And it helps to have an underlying sense of yourself as a coper, someone who is resourced inside, who can cope with life, including tough knocks, um, and can live well meanwhile and sing on your branch <laughs> going down the river meanwhile. So I think that's really relevant here, is knowing that you don't know. You don't know everything. And you can know all that there is to know about something and make the 98% best choice and one time in 50 it, or one person in 50, it will turn out badly. So I'm not saying this to freak you out. I'm just trying to be real with you and respect you enough to be real with you. So that's kind of a comfort. And then inside that, I think, uh, as people who know me would say, I'm a big due, dilig due, dilig <laughs> due diligence kind of guy. I like assessment. I like finding out. I like turning over every stone. I like knowing that I've turned over every stone. I, I know <laughs> that I've turned over all the possible reasonable stones. And then based on that, I make my call. And sometimes at the end of the day, you use your analysis and you do a thorough job with analysis and it informs your gut. It informs your intuition and boom, you make that call. You know, you, you place your bet on that choice and then whew, you spin the wheel, take a breath and, you know, try to be in touch with what is not burning, what is not vibrating, where death, where impermanence does not have any footing and in that delight. Yeah. Okay. Well, I really enjoyed this. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else did. <laughs> I've gotten a lot out of not knowing because, uh, man, I'm a recovering knower. <laughs> I'm a recovering doer and I'm early in my recovery. Please help me. Um, we need friends. We think about the way we create good company for each other. If we let it be okay for other people not to know. And then we don't squeeze them and pressure them to know immediately. You know, wow. And if we try to create a model that it's okay to not know, at least for a while, don't know yet. Okay, I'm on the road to find out. I think that's Cat Stevens, who has a different name now. 